Man is the measure of all things, of things that are that they are, and of things that are not that they're not. These are the words of Protagoras, a philosopher who lived sometime around the 5th century in Athens, Greece. Protagoras was a pre-Socratic philosopher, and while Plato disagreed vehemently with Protagoras' philosophy, Plato thought Protagoras sophisticated, or maybe dangerous, enough to have devoted two of his dialogues, the Theaetetus and Protagoras, to sparring with Protagoras' ideas. Protagoras has been called many things, a relativist, a sophist, a forerunner of postmodernism. The problem is that, unfortunately for us, none of Protagoras' writings survive. The only account of what we have of his philosophy are second-hand accounts, mostly by Plato, but also by the skeptical philosopher Sextus Empiricus and the biographer Diogenes Laertius. During his life and after, Protagoras was derided as a sophist, one of the worst things a philosopher could call you. The term sophist was originally a neutral term that simply meant that you were a professional teacher of knowledge. Plato and others turned it into a term of derision, meaning something like the opposite of a philosopher. Philosophers, you see, sought knowledge and used reasoning to find out what is true, good, and beautiful. Sophists, like Protagoras, were accused of teaching how to use words cleverly, even if that meant obscuring truth, good, and beauty. Is there truth to this charge? It's complicated. Let's start by looking at the very few things we know about what Protagoras argued. First, there's a statement that we started this video with, usually called the man is the measure doctrine. Let's see it again. It is said to be the first line of a book that he wrote that was either called On Truth, or more sinisterly, The Overthrowers. Man is the measure of all things, of things that are that they are, and of things that are not that they're not. We also know that Protagoras was an agnostic regarding the existence of gods. In what was thought to be a book called On the Gods, Protagoras wrote this. Concerning the gods, I have no means of knowing whether they exist or not, nor of what sort they may be, because of the obscurity of the subject and the brevity of human life. We also know from second-hand writings that Protagoras believed, and was maybe the first person to openly teach, that for every seemingly strong argument, there is an opposing argument that can be made more forceful with rhetorical technique. Lastly, Plato's Protagoras dialogue tells us that Protagoras believed that virtue could be taught to everyone, and that everyone has the capability to exercise good political judgment. Athens at the time was a participatory democracy, a style of governance Plato was opposed to, and some argue that Protagoras' position here is a defense of democratic governance. Of course, it could be a sales pitch. Remember, Protagoras charged money for his teachings, so saying that everyone had the ability to be taught virtue and good judgment may have been good business. Whatever the case, these four positions have something in common. The idea that seeking truth, good, and beauty are deeply human things. Humans are, for Protagoras, at the vital center of these activities. When judging what is true, humans are the measure. When figuring out if gods exist, humans are, again, the measure. When deciding what positions to believe, how humans argue their respective cases has a central effect. When deciding what is just and right, it is the opinion and judgment of humans that count. We should also think about how Protagoras and his human-centric ideas fit in with Athens of the time. When Protagoras was teaching, as I've mentioned, Athens was becoming a democracy, where at least some male property citizens could vote. And instead of powerful elites making decisions for the people, people were increasingly allowed to give and listen to speeches, so that each could try to persuade others of what the correct course was. One thing Protagoras sold, what led Plato to claim him a mere sophist, was the ability to learn how to persuade others. That was antithetical to the approach of Plato and after him Aristotle. Despite their differing methods of getting there, for Plato and Aristotle, truths were out there waiting to be discovered. One argued in order to discover human independent truths, and the better argument was better because it was true. In a sense, Protagoras flipped this equation. Rather than truth being the object of inquiry, it was the product of inquiry. Rather than an argument strength coming from the fact that it had truth on its side, the argument we could make the most persuasive becomes the one we call true. Truth isn't found, it's made. Let's think of the matter this way. Imagine that you and I are having an argument about something that seems like a matter of identifiable fact, maybe whether vaccines inoculate against disease. You say they do, I say they don't. We argue about it, and let's say that neither of us is convinced by the other. The most tempting course is to say that one of us are wrong. 
There is a true answer to this question, and one of us has it, while the other only thinks they do. Protagoras seems to be saying that what we really have is two people with differing opinions we probably equally believe to be informed and correct. If that description seems silly, it's probably because we want to say that in reality, only one of those positions about vaccines is correct. Vaccines do what they do, inoculate against disease or not, and what they do is independent of people's opinions. The problem, and it is a subtle one, is that what reality will show is precisely what's in dispute. You think it will vindicate you, and I think it will vindicate me. If one of us turns out wrong in our prediction, it will have to come through us being convinced of that. The world and its happenings are often open to interpretation. What you tell me is a pro-vaccine scientific consensus I might interpret as a well-oiled conspiracy or the ramblings of untrustworthy elites. And what I interpret as renegade scientists who bravely speak anti-vax truth to power, you might interpret as idiosyncratic misfits exercising flawed reasoning. Yes, either vaccines work or they don't. But invoking the truth that is not relative to our belief in it is to invoke precisely what is in dispute and precisely what neither of us have real access to. And what matters is not to be able to tell the other that your position is true, but to get them to believe that your position is true. In a very real and important way, the only way to make your position true for them is to convince them of it. Truth comes by way of opinion. Another way to think about this is to think about what happened when vaccinology first came about. Those who believed that exposing bodies to weakened versions of a disease could inoculate against disease had to demonstrate that this was so to the satisfaction of others. We could say that they came across a truth that was true even before others were convinced, but convincing others, and really a critical mass of authoritative others, is the reason we call this theory true. Humans were the measure as they always are. And even if you're convinced that vaccines do inoculate against disease, that this is true regardless of people being convinced by it, you have to admit that truths no one believes to be true are nothing short of useless. Truths only become useful as truths when people believe they are true. Let's pause here to think about an important ambiguity in Protagoras' doctrine, the word man. Aside from the gender exclusivity typical of writing at this time, he doesn't indicate whether man is singular or plural. Does he mean that every person is their own measure of truth? Or does he mean that humankind as a collective decides the truth? If the former, he would mean that whatever individuals believe about the efficacy of vaccines is true as far as they are concerned. But if he means the collective man, that would mean that truth is a collective process. And whatever the critical mass of authoritative people, in this case scientists, judge to be true is what we call true until or unless another idea gains consensus. The fact is that we don't have enough of Protagoras' writings to know which of these he has in mind, and scholars are mixed on the issue. I'd like to think that in some way we can mean man both as singular and plural. Look at the marketplace. In an important way, the prices of goods and services are decided by the results of collective processes of supply and demand. But I can still decide the price I am willing to pay for something. Even though the market says that a good is worth a certain price, I can still decide that it's not worth that to me. Can truth work the same way on an individual and collective level? Maybe science, for instance, is a collective process where scientists decide what understandings of the world to call true. But while we should all take into account what experts believe is true, we are all obviously still the individual measures of whether we buy their consensus or whether we think the truth lies in another direction. Scientific debate is admittedly a hard case for Protagoras to make, because we're very used to talking about science as a finder of objective truths out there. So let's turn to a different discussion, one about whether a particular work of art is beautiful. You say it is, and I say it's somewhere between meh and hideous. I think here most of us will readily grant that whatever we're talking about, we're not tracking a quality of beauty that exists somewhere in the piece of art waiting to be objectively discovered. Especially when we disagree about such a piece, it becomes plausible that beauty is some sort of interaction between the art and us, and that humans are the measures of beauty. Beautiful is the way you describe your appraisal of the work, not an objective feature of the work itself. And when we disagree about the work's beauty, it can be the case that the work is both beautiful Beautiful, and not that whatever the person experiences as beautiful is, for them, beautiful, with no arbiter of beauty above the human one. If the man is the measure doctrine seems more plausible when it comes to art, we can ask why it seems less plausible when it comes to science. Beauty is evaluation, but isn't truth also evaluation? To say that something is beautiful is akin to saying that I or we experience the thing in a certain way. 
Well, that's how Protagoras, I think, views talk about truths. To say that a belief is true can't be anything more than to say that I or we judge it to be true. We affix the word true to it, not because we have accessed the world beyond ourselves and our belief indeed corresponds with this world. It is because we have used our very bounded and concrete and human experience to judge that belief X is reliable enough to call true. And that means, at least potentially, that when different people make different judgments about what is true, there is nothing beyond judgment we can use to adjudicate that dispute. Now, we'll get to some of the objections to the man is the measure doctrine in a subsequent video, but I should say that there are several things Protagoras is not saying. He's not saying that there is no world out there that we can use to figure out what to believe. He's just saying that different people might experience, relate to, and interpret that world differently. And when that happens, it doesn't do any good to try to look at the world as it really is, because the world always comes to us mediated by our experience. In fact, Sextus Empiricus summarizes Protagoras' doctrine this way, quote, Truth is something relative by reason of the fact that everything that has appeared to be the case or has been opined by someone is immediately real to that person, end quote. What I believe will be experienced by me as true until someone or something, another person or experience with the world, convinces me otherwise. Then I will call this new thing true. He's also not saying that every opinion on what is true is as good as every other. He would very likely say that we should trust the scientists because even though scientists can indeed be wrong, they usually use pretty good scientific methods to form their beliefs, and science has shown itself pretty good at figuring out what to believe. But that's different than saying that we should believe scientists because they get at truths. Rather, they get at beliefs that help us successfully navigate the world. And lastly, he isn't saying that we can't get knowledge and therefore shouldn't believe anything. He's saying almost the opposite. He's empowering knowers by putting the knower rather than the knowledge at the center of the equation. Most people say that we should do what we can to believe what is true. To quote the X-Files, truth is out there, and we should do our best to find it. But that has humans in the passive role, the finder of the truth that is already out there. For Pythagoras, our job is, in a way, to make truth, to inquire and experiment, and to use our judgments as best we can, and to believe what seems most true to us. We, citizens, scientists, religionists, and everyone, are the measures of what is true, and there are no measures other than us. It is only by people forming beliefs about the world that we even have truths. The beliefs we form individually and collectively are the truths of the world. As you can imagine, this view of truth and how it is made has provoked several criticisms from the charge of self-refutation, to the idea that it violates the law of non-contradiction, to its potentially disastrous conclusion that every view must be as good as every other, that if man is the measure, there must be no such thing as wisdom. I'll deal with these in a separate video devoted to articulating and maybe refuting each of these objections.